Hello, everyone, and welcome to 2021. Hopefully, 2021 will be better for you than 2020. Uh, my name is Stephen Mead with Domicile Real Estate, where we are on a mission to help California's renters become homeowners. And this is our weekly market update for first time home buyers. And this week, we're going to actually run through our regular slides pretty quickly. Uh, but we are then going to do our 2020 year in review, where we take a look back and how did 2020 really end up comparing to 2019. So without further ado, let's get started. It is New Year's Day, um, and uh, yeah, we've got a lot to go through. So stick around. We will be doing our 2020 year in review towards the end. So here's our first slide. Of course, this is home prices. What do we see home prices doing? Well, actually, they have kind of had a nice little uptick towards the end of the year here. You can see just a little bit of a gain. I will preface this by saying the week between Christmas and New Year's is the weirdest week for home sales. It is the strangest week. It is the one where the numbers make the least amount of sense and you, you really can't glean a lot of Ford data. So we're going to run through this stuff pretty quickly. I will point out the things that I think are important to sort of pay attention to. Uh, mortgage rates were largely flat. Uh, as you can see, we are still below our 2018 price point on entry level single family homes, and we are way below our 2018 payment level for our entry level condos. Again, if we're looking at income, uh, minimum income required with 5% down and no other debts. By the way, just as a reminder, we do run our stats based on Los Angeles and Orange counties. So we combine those stats together. Our entry level home is a three bedroom, two bath single family home and our entry level condo is a two bedroom, two bath. So your minimum income required is just under 88,000 on the single family entry level home and about $65,000 on our entry level condo. Now we get into stuff that's a little bit more interesting. Um, so our absorption rate of new listings, remember this is our ratio of new listings to ones that went into escrow. And you have to remember that homes going into escrow kind of trail by a week. And the reason why is because if a home goes on the market, say on Saturday, it probably will not go into escrow, even if it's a hot property until the middle of the following week. And this is a week that I will tell you while deals get made during this past week, very, very few sellers want to put their home on the market between Christmas and New Year's. It just, uh, it just doesn't happen. So what that does is that skews these absorption rate figures way higher, which is what's happened here. We're at about 110% for both our condos and single families. That is not a real number. And in fact, I think we'll expect the next week, we'll actually see these numbers drop big time because all the people who are planning on putting, who would normally put their home in the market this week, basically held off until next week. So we're gonna see a flood of new listings hit the market next week to kind of make up for the lack of listings this week. Um, we'll have to see if I'm right on that prediction, but I, I'm pretty sure I will given years past. Now, the next thing is our total inventory. And this is something we've been watching for a while. And I think it's, it's really important to note this. If you are a first time buyer and you're out there and you're getting very discouraged because it feels like there are no houses out there that you want to buy. Well, it's not your imagination. Uh, the level of inventory, I mean, we were almost at 2000 actives in our entry level condo. That is down below 1500, 1400. Uh, at one point, we were like 1,800 here for our single family homes, and now we are towards almost near 1,000 houses. So, I mean, these are drastic reductions in the available inventory. The bright spot is this is perfectly normal this time of year. It might be a little bit more acute in this particular year, but in general, this is the, the trend line, right? Inventory starts falling once we hit November. That's not that unusual. Um, it's a little bit worse this year, but I think we will see starting next week that these inventory levels will begin to climb. So wait for us on that graph to see kind of a little bit of a hockey stick happen on those inventory numbers. And then finally, we have our week's supply of homes. And remember, we take a look back. We look at how many homes went into escrow in the last two weeks. And then we try to gauge, well, how many weeks supply do we have of houses if nothing new came in the market? And while it turns out for single family homes, we are still below four and we're just hovering above eight weeks on our entry level condos. Okay, so um, now we are moving on to our year in review and our stats and kind of what we can learn. And the one thing that I, I wanna mention here is why it's important to do this, especially in years like 2020. And the reason being is when you are in the middle of 2020, 
it can feel like a complete crazy mess. Uh, however, when you take a look back, I think there's a little bit more clarity on what's going on. Uh, a good analogy might be if you've ever been to Disneyland, and if you're in Southern California, you probably have. You know, in your mind, when you walk around Disneyland, you have an idea of the layout, right? Like the map. Like in your mind, you're like, oh, Tomorrowland is over here. But what happens is if you send up a drone, right, and you get an actual top-down view, uh, there's a lot of insights that you get, for example, you know, like where does the monorail run around? Like you, all these things that are, are difficult to see on the ground are very, very clear from an overhead view. And I think the same thing is true when we take a look back and we look at 2020 as kind of this overhead view of 2020 rather than this week to week view. I think it's important to have that second perspective. So let's jump in here. One of the things I wanna talk about is sales numbers, right? And I think this is an, you know, we had a prediction and we'll see whether we, whether this is true in a couple of minutes here, that ultimately this market was going to catch up and we're gonna have approximately the same number of home sales in 2020 as we did in 2019. And if you look at this graph here, this is our three bed, two bath, entry level, single family home. If you look, 2019 is in the blue and 2020 is in the red, right? We actually started off stronger in 2020 than in 2019. It was actually a better year. Things were kind of heading up and then March sort of happened. And uh, you, you see here these sales numbers, I mean, just completely off the pace, right? Um, and then things started to head up and eventually we actually crossed here. And you have to remember, these are sales, so they're delayed by a month. So crossing in August actually meant that July was really the month where sort of our market velocity, you might call it, equaled where we were in, where it crossed over, where it equaled 2019's numbers. And then it actually remained higher for the rest of the year on our single family homes. And, you know, when you look at this graph, this seems like really drastic when you look at this hole here. But um, if we take a look at our cumulative numbers, so this shows sort of, you know, it, it's a running total throughout the year. You find, yeah, in March, we were ahead, then we slid. But look what happened is we actually slowly caught up and we ended up, I mean, the difference between these numbers is really not that great. Um, you know, by the end of the year, things had actually pretty much evened out or close to it. And we actually have that graph too. So for our total three bedroom, two bath, single family homes in Los Angeles and Orange Counties, in 2019, 20,597 of those homes sold. In 2020, it was 19,218. So the reality is we were, you know, I mean, let's see, a little bit, five, 6% off the pace. Um, now, if you watched our, if you watched our year in review for our whole market, the whole market was actually a, a bit closer. It was like one or 2% off. It wasn't off much at all. Um, this kind of shows, I think this highlights in a way sort of this inventory shortage and this inventory constrained market. The fact that the rest of the market caught up in total sales, but these entry level homes did not. I think that's something really important to note. So if you feel like you're out there and, and you, you're considering buying your first home, you're looking at these sort of three bed, two bath, single family entry level homes, and it just seems like the market is a lot harder than it is for your friends buying larger homes. It's not an illusion. I actually think the market is a bit harder. You have less inventory to choose from. So these are our numbers for single family homes. And kind of like, you know, I think the lesson to learn here is that even though the market seemed absolutely nuts and weird March and July, the reality is, is that this year ended up with about the number of sales we would have expected normally, especially when you look at the, the market as a whole, even though we're kind of focusing on this entry level segment. Um, now we're gonna move on to condos where the story is actually a little bit different. So if we look at our monthly two bedroom condo sales, these actually look pretty similar. You know, we have our same kind of a crossover point here. We have our same sort of trough um, in that sort of April, May, June timeframe, right? And then things swing up, they cross and then remain higher for the rest of the year. We had, a, we had a nice upswing in sales actually towards the end of the year this year in our condo. Some of that inventory got eaten away. And I think, I think that is also another thing that sort of illustrates this idea of a constricted market. There's a lot more inventory for these condos than there are for the single family homes. And I think that's why they got a sales uptick towards the end of the year and things were a bit flatter on the single family home side. Now, if we do the same sort of cumulative graph, 
as we did before, we see kind of a similar story, but, but it's actually even better, right, with our condos because things were ahead, then they slipped behind and they stayed behind, but our condos actually pretty much within a margin of error, they caught up to those 2019 numbers. We actually saw that, you know, people realized interest rates were low and they took advantage of that. So despite a pandemic, despite unemployment numbers that were big, we were able to kind of eke out the same number of sales as we had in 2019. And if we pull up that graph, we see that, I mean, our, our numbers are, are incredibly close, right? I mean, we're within 40 units of, you know, within 40 units. I think what 1% would be 90 units. So, I mean, we were within half a percent of 2019 sales. Uh, I, I think that really sort of tells you that story confirms that our single family home market, the number of units, the number of homes that were sold in 2020 was really held back by the amount of inventory that we had because condos where we had more inventory, they actually caught up completely with that number. So, I mean, we could have expected another five or five percent of sales or so out of our single families if we actually had the inventory in that entry level price segment. So now we're going to talk about pricing, right? And and which I think is what everybody wants to know. And I, I think what's great about being able to take a look back is this can kind of confirm some of the feelings on the on the ground in the market. And anybody who's an active agent who knows what they're doing, so so we don't have an exclusive monopoly on this, um, will tell you that there, there's generally a feeling of market momentum, and the good experienced agents are somewhat in tune to that feeling. Of momentum. They're able to kind of read sort of a bunch of different sources and develop sort of an intuition, but it's not really an intuition. It really is database. It's just based on a whole bunch of myriad of little factors put together. So if we come here and we look at the median prices, and again, we're going to compare this to 2019, and this is by month. And actually, I said median price. That's a mistake. This is our entry-level quartile price. So this is really meant to sort of focus in on that, that 25 percentile level of the market. So not the mid, middle point of the market, but that, that 25% mark, which I think is really a much, a much bigger indication of actual entry level homes that you would be looking at. And you know, if, if you look at this, these graphs actually do line up right in a way. And that's kind of like a confirmation of, are we on the right track for it? And here's what I mean by these graphs lining up. So 2019 is in the blue again, and 2020 is in the red. So if you look, you know, we had a fairly smooth um, 2019, and we actually had a nice little uptick at the end, which is not normally what happens. Um, 2019 definitely was a market that sort of finished very strong at the end of the year. You'll notice this price point is almost exactly where we started 2020, which would make sense, right? I think there's something really important to point out on this graph. And if you watched our other video, other video uh, for our whole market update for market in 2020 review, sorry there. Um, I mentioned this and I think it's really important. When, when people, when you talk about home prices and what home prices are gonna do. So, so if you read the newspaper, home prices are expected to go up three to 5% in 2021. I actually think that that's probably pretty, pretty close to accurate. In people's minds, they think the graph goes like this, right? They think that that means the graph's gonna start like this and it's gonna just gently move up like this. And the reality is that is not how the market works. It almost never goes like that. It almost always has kind of these fits and starts and maybe even a moment where it retreats a little bit. Um, and if you look at the, these graphs for both these years, I think that really illustrates that point. 2020 was even you know, a bumpier. But if you look here, you know, things start, then they plateaued in 2019, then kind of strong through the summer, then they actually retreated a little bit. Then we kind of went up in the early fall, retreated, and then finished off with a little bit of a, with some price growth. Okay, that's, that is a fairly typical year uh, by all accounts. 2020, a little bit of a bumpier year, right? we started out a really big spring. Like it looked like this was gonna be a big year for price growth. Then uh, we had COVID-19, right? A lot of uncertainty. Prices kind of, they fell a little and they, they pretty much plateaued for a bit. Then if you look around this June, July timeframe, you know, if there was ever a moment where you felt like in this market, if, if you were watching this market this year, 
and you felt like there was a moment the prices just jumped, right? Like like in a very short period of time. This is that is exactly what happened, right? They jumped, they overheated, they retreated slightly, and then we got yet another fall jump, then plateau, 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 and then a jump towards the end. And you know, the reality is this is how the market goes sometimes. You have a lot of external factors that affect consumer sentiment, interest rates, all these things can make a very big difference in sort of that market momentum. You know, even if the year finishes, say, 4% up, it, it, it didn't go up, you know, it didn't go up by a certain amount each month. It didn't go up by a third of a percentage point um, each month. That's just not how the market works. So if we look at our, our, our total price growth for the year, you know, I think this tells another little bit of a story, right? So in 2019, 2019 ended up being a very, very solid year for price growth, 8%. But boy, if you were in the single family market, you saw a 15% growth in prices. And I think a big part of that growth was related to interest rates, but not all of it. I think another part of this growth is that we have, we have some real serious changes in, in consumer demand. And I don't know if these are going to be permanent or not. I think in general, and, and when, we look at our, when we look at our condo graph, you're, you're going to really understand how this is. I think consumers overwhelmingly said, if we can find a way to get a single family home, we would rather have a single family home. I, I think that was really a message in 2020. And I don't know if that's going to continue in the work from home world and the COVID world where people want just a feeling more distance from their neighbors, which you do not generally get in a condo. I don't know if these are going to be permanent changes or not, but they definitely fueled sort of some of that price growth that we saw this year. Now, if we move on and we go to, let me get our screen share back up here. If we move on and we go and take a look at our condos, we can kind of go through this graph here. And, you know, condos had a little bit of a different trajectory on prices than the single family homes, right? Now, if we look at what condos did in 2019, maybe it was a little bit bumpier than, than normal, but still a fairly smooth, smooth graph. But if we look here, I mean, boy, 2020 was a roller coaster ride of prices. Things started flat, then we got a spring bump. Boy, but unlike the stagnation we saw in single families, we actually saw a little bit of a drop momentarily for a couple months. And then condos started zooming back up, fell a little bit in the fall, and then finished very, very strongly, right? And, you know, when you look at a graph like this, though, sometimes it's a little harder to reconcile. Well, how did we really, how did we really end up? Um, you know, I think that condos have always been a more volatile uh, property type, but especially because of COVID, I think some of those work from home, wanting to distance, I think some of those things actually really had a bigger effect on the condo market uh, than the single family market. And it's really shown in this, right? Like, so back in 2019, we had a 6% growth in prices. Those are really nice numbers. Everybody will take 6%. That was about double inflation in 2019, a very good year to be a, a condo owner. Uh, this year was better, but we didn't see nearly the same price growth as we saw in the single family homes. And you know what, that should hardly be surprising, right? And the reason why that's not surprising is all year long, we've been talking about how the payment level on condos is way cheaper than it was in 2018. That just shows you that the prices weren't keeping pace with those payment drops due to interest rates. So, I mean, I think if you're the kind of person struggling just to get into the market, I still think a condo is going to be great because I don't see, well, even some of these changes might be permanent in terms of people wanting single family homes a little bit more. I don't think we're going to see a shift like we did this year. I think this year things shifted away, but now it's stabilized. It's not, it's not going to get any more towards single family going forward. I think that shift has kind of happened all it's going to happen. And, you know, we're, we're going to see things stabilize out. Um, and you also have a lot more inventory as a condo buyer. So, you know, my kind of final thoughts are, what do I think is going to happen in 2021? Well, I think earlier on, we figured that interest rates were going to jump. It looks like that's probably not going to happen. The vaccination rollout is going to be much slower. The reopening of things is going to be much slower. We're not going to see sort of a sudden exuberance. So I, I do think we're going to enjoy low interest rates for a little while longer. So that's really nice and, 
looking really good. I'm hoping we're going to see some inventory growth in the next couple of months. Uh, because as I said, I think our market is inventory constricted. Uh, I think a little bit of inventory won't really affect prices too much, but it will greatly improve the experience that buyers have in the marketplace. Um, you know, with that said, you know, we have a lot of home builders that are building as many houses as they possibly can in California, but many of these developments are in outlying areas. And, you know, the work from home thing is, is kind of a mixed bag. Some of the companies are saying, we're going to always still allow some work from home. Um, but some of them are saying, well, we need you to come back two or three days a week. So I don't think we're going to see this wholesale moving out into the middle of nowhere kind of a trend that may be predicted. I think people might be willing to go a little farther than they would have gone. But I think they still desire these communities like Irvine, Orange County, being near the coast. I, I don't think those priorities have had sort of the, the huge shift that many people expected that they would. And you can see that in the prices, which, you know, they've been strong all over Southern California. It's not like they've been strong in one area and really weak in another. They, they've been pretty strong all over. Anyhow, thank you guys so much for watching. Welcome to 2021. Uh, we'll be continuing our weekly videos. We also have our whole market market update for Southern California, not focused on first time home buyers. We do a couple interesting statistics that are a little bit different in those videos. So definitely hit that uh, subscribe button, like our videos, hit the notification bell. We love comments, but we'd love even more to work with you. So if you are a renter who is also on a mission to become a homeowner, we're probably a pretty good match for you. Definitely reach out and we will see you next week.